everyone. Uh, welcome to the ARC's presentation on 988, which is a brand new development in crisis care. This webinar is intended to provide general information about what 988 is, how it came to be, and what we can expect at the federal and state levels and also how disability advocates are responding to this new development that touches upon mental health, substance use, disability, and criminal justice. I'm Carlene Ponder, Director of Disability Rights and Housing Policy for the ARC. Joining me today are my colleagues, Michael Atkins and Juan Guerrero, who are both on the federal policy team. Co-hosting is the Autism Society of America. My colleague, Kim Mushino is joining us. Thank you, and we will go ahead and begin. So in a historic move, the US Congress passed bipartisan legislation designating 988 as the nationwide mental health crisis response number. The National Suicide Hotline Designation Act of 2020 was signed into law in October. The federal legislation requires that phone service providers direct all 988 calls to the existing National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. It permits a fee change associated with mobile or IP enabled devices. This fee can pay for effective routing of calls to an appropriate crisis center and personnel and stabilization services directly responding to 988. The benefit of using the phone tax is that it becomes a stable revenue source to cover the hotline itself, and state legislatures don't have to address it year after year um, it, um, once it's authorized initially, making 988 less susceptible to budget fights. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the federal agency that oversees the hotline, must ensure the hotline is equipped to provide specialized resources to high-risk populations. The statute itself specifically requests a detailed strategy in providing nationwide suicide prevention and crisis services for LGBTQ plus youth, minorities, rural individuals, or other high-risk populations. That other category is prime for persons with disabilities, including people with intellectual or developmental disability. Um, the prevalence of a mental health condition amongst persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities is estimated to be 30 to 40% of that population. Um, yeah, 30 to 40% of people with IDD also have a mental health condition. So the ARC and disability groups can advocate for specific training around uh, disability. Um, we can ask for peer supports to be part of any continuum of care um, that supports 988. And we can also ask for other resources, disability specific resources as states begin to implement 988 and corresponding crisis services. So according to SAMHSA, there are some best practices that they've released in a toolkit. Those best practices include having 24 seven um, clinically staffed call centers that can serve as the hub of an integrated mental health system, mobile crisis response teams that can respond to people who need on the ground support rather than law enforcement, and crisis receiving and stabilization facilities that provide short-term services rather than relying upon ER or hospital environment. SAMHSA sees 988 as a first step towards a transformed crisis care system. In much the same way as emergency medical services have expanded in the US, the agency, the, the, um, the agency believes that we can work to make sure that um, the rollout of 988 includes many, many of the, the practices and supports that are gonna be needed to make um, anticipated call increases successful. Um, to date, they've given $282 million to states to strengthen and ex expand the uh, existing suicide prevention hotline which includes text and chat capability. 
and also to build up staffing for local crisis call centers. Call centers um, are currently available in a lot of states. Many of them are operated by the same company that operates Lifeline, which will continue to operate 988. But with 988 being rolled out at the national level, um, it's gonna be really important that um, staffing is adequate to handle the, the number of anticipated calls. I think currently, in the crisis center that serves my local community, staffing capability is currently only at 90% of the calls that we get now. So that wouldn't be sufficient if 988 um, becomes a number that's well known and is utilized at a higher rate. So there's also new CMS guidance from the Center for Medicaid, Medicare Services that was released in December, 2021. Um, the CMS guidance states that providing uh, mobile crisis interventions um, is something that states can receive an enhanced uh, federal medical assistance percentage or FMAP payment for. So typically, um, mobile crisis services would receive an FMAP, uh, which is a federal match, would receive an FMAP of, say, 45 to 55%. So under the new CMS guidance, states who are um, um, either beginning mobile crisis services or enhancing their mobile crisis services can receive an 85% match. Um, and they can receive that for the first 12 quarters. Um, states can use their section 1915C waiver um, to add or modify mobile crisis interventions. And states can claim, they can also claim an administrative cost for IT upgrades. Um, IT upgrades could be made for things such as making sure that um, the um, hotline and associated services are capable of responding to people who, for example, have hearing impairments. So to so so they could, you know, so those administrative costs would be covered um, in um, the administrative, enhanced administrative um, um, claim. To be a qualifying mobile crisis team, um, one has to have a licensed behavioral health care professional. You should include other professionals such as trained peer support specialists, and all team members must be trained in trauma-informed care and de-escalation. So language considerations, including deafness, should be considered, and teams are to respond to crises in a timely manner. Um, I know that in um, one community, currently, you know, we're you know pre 988 and pre all of the um, the, the federal um, enhancements that it can take a mobile crisis team up to three hours to respond to an incident, and I've heard police officers say that they often won't use that service because of that time delay. As you can imagine, um, if you're on the scene and you are calling a mobile crisis team to come out and it's gonna take them three hours to get to you is not really efficient. So um, the CMS guidance says, you know, that these mobilization, the mobile crisis unit should respond in a tim timely manner. I don't think that that's defined. Um, I have seen one best practice, I think coming out of the state of Arizona, might've been Tucson where their mobile crisis teams respond in 30 minutes when a call comes in from a police officer and they make it a priority. So that certainly sounds like um, a much better option than a three hour wait. Uh, SAMHSA also considers a successful mobile crisis system, one that avoids unnecessary law enforcement involvement and hospitalization. The CMS guidance encourages partnerships between mobile crisis services and schools with a particular emphasis on reducing arrests for youth in crisis. So it'll be interesting to see um, how those school partnerships develop should they, should, you know, communities take advantage of them. Um, and, and to see how, you know, these, these teams are able to interrupt um, youth being referred to law enforcement. Um, and again, that's assuming that communities have teams in place that can support these types of needs. So now we're gonna go back a few slides, actually. We're gonna go back um, on the slide presentation to talk about something called disability justice. So you wanna go back, go back a few more. 
There we go. All right, so the term disability justice recognizes that the complexities of multiply marginalized disabled people um, aims to be holistic in rec and aims to be holistic in recognizing these complexities. So the way that I think about it when we talk about disability justice is um, the intersection of disability, race, and in particular in this in this particular um, 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 new development 988, I think about the intersection of law enforcement or criminal justice with disability. Currently, the lack of alternatives to 911 for people in crisis has left mental and behavioral emotional crisis response services to armed police officers. Um, this has had a, a, a negative effect, including um, violent confrontations with law enforcement the use of jails to stabilize people in crisis and a lack of actual treatment for people in need of therapeutic support. Um, moreover, 50% of people killed by law enforcement have a disability. More than half of these are, uh, half of black people with a disability have been arrested by the time that they turn 28. So those statistics are pretty daunting. Um, and, you know, for, advocates working in the space of disability justice, you know, we just believe that the outcomes of community crisis interventions should not include incarceration or involuntary commitment to a mental health or other locked facility. So, you know, we don't want to um, trade law enforcement um, and, and, you know, that's one form of carceral involvement for another <laughs> which is um, going to result in people being, um, you know, given treatments that perhaps they don't need or um, being detained in a different facility rather than jail. So we, you know, those are two things to keep in mind. But I think my colleague Juan has some questions about this topic now. Yeah, I know you mentioned it with 9 and 8 and the importance of disability justice, but you, have any like notes or comments on any implications that 988 might have for racial justice in particular? Yeah, I mean, I think, you, you know, I 988, I think it has a lot of implications for racial justice because um, we're talking about an alternative to 911 and law enforcement. And um, as I mentioned, currently that that's, you know, what we have in this country for the most part is that when people are in mental health crisis, um, 911 is typically the only option um, that communities can rely on if they feel that um, they need some, some extra assistance. And for people of color, um, I mean, I'm sure we can all think of like high profile incidents where somebody's been in a mental health crisis and law enforcement has, um, been involved and it has resulted in uh, that person perhaps losing their life or, you know, many other incidents that aren't high profile, but result in person being taken to jail rather than um, being considered somebody who's experiencing a health crisis at the time. And just a follow up question. I know that a lot of this is delegated to like state advocacy efforts. Is there anything that you could just describe for like criminal justice advocates on the ground who would want to take up 988 as an issue, this legislative cycle for a lot of those states or are there models that you could recommend or? Yeah, I mean, and, and now's a really good time to do that because state legis I think a lot of state legislatures are, are actually in session now and 988 is still a topic that's brand new to a lot of people in a lot of the country. Um, I, I know that um, when I talked to some state legislatures in Maryland just a few months ago that, you know, they were pretty clear that our state wasn't ready um, to implement 988 in terms of one, you know, we don't, we haven't um, enacted funding, we haven't enacted legislation to pay for the hotline itself. Um, and currently most local uh, crisis call centers are understaffed um, and that's, you know, considering people are calling numbers that aren't an easy to remember three digit number. So um, certainly, you know, they can, those crisis hotlines um, 
are concerned about becoming overwhelmed. So um, some states are further ahead. Virginia was the first in the country, I believe, to actually enact a fee to cover 988 through that phone tax that was permissible in the um, federal legislation. And um, we'll talk a little bit about um, later, a little bit about how that came to be in Virginia, but um, Virginia took the lead after um, a long campaign by advocates for uh, a lot of, I mean, mental health advocates, uh, criminal justice reform advocates, and a lot of people came together after yet another example of somebody who was in crisis um, being confronted with police and, and tragically killed. So. Yeah, it's really amazing that they're able to do that in Virginia. It sets a really good precedent for like other states, but in those advocacy efforts, are there any like statistics about disability and mental health or policing that you believe that would be really useful in those efforts? Yeah, so a statistic that comes up a lot is um, an estimate that people with mental illness are 16 times more likely to be shot when encountering law enforcement. And I just saw something the other day from Los Angeles, which, which um, said that in 2021, um, the police chief actually estimated that one third of all police shootings in the city involved somebody who was struggling with mental illness. Um, as a whole, um, data shows that Black people are more likely to be shot um, in law enforcement encounters. Um, the Washington Post keeps a database of police shootings um, of all unarmed people who were killed in 2015, 40% were Black men, followed by Latino men. And I also saw another interesting report from the Center for Indian Country Development. They released a paper in March 2020 noting that Native American women and Black men have more than four times fatal encounters um, per population as their white counterparts. So thank you. For, for asking those questions. And so, you know, um, this is a brand new development, a lot to be learned. There's a lot that's still unknown and some potential pitfalls can be anticipated early on, <laughs> but I'm sure that we will see more as this is rolled out across the country. So I think, Michael, you had some questions about pitfalls we should be considering. Yeah, thank you so much for providing that overview. Um, you know, you mentioned that 988 is set to go live in July of this year. Um, but you mentioned that, you know, because it's on a state to state basis, do you think that states are prepared to handle the calls? Yeah, well, yeah, so I, I think, you know, so probably, probably not is the short answer to that. Um, for a lot of lot of the reasons that, you know, we were we were just talking about, but, um, and also because I think you know, because this haven't gone, this hasn't gone live, and it's been a sleeper issue. I just really think that a lot of places are just unprepared um, for um, what this could mean. I mean, I mean, if we're talking about having an alternative to nine one one, I mean, think about how many calls go into, you know, nine one one every year. Um, so, um, yeah, states probably aren't. States probably aren't prepared. So in that case, um, you know, where states, you know, this program or this, this has been instituted, but states have not, you know, created this program within their state, what would happen if people call 988 and ask for crisis services um, that aren't available, such as a mobile crisis team? What happens in that case? So, you know, the thing with 988 is that it's just the, the federal legislation really was bare bones. So it just established the um, number um, basically, it established the number 988, and it allowed states to to tax phone companies to service this number to provide the number. Um, and a lot of states, you know, still haven't done that. Um, all of the other things that would be needed to support 988 um, to make it successful, like having mobile crisis services. So those are things that aren't actually part of the federal legislation. But um, I think. You know, the administration certainly has been interested in um, making sure that we are we are building a continuum of care. Again, you know, we, we talked about SAMHSA awarding, you know, $282 million in grants already um, and uh, mobile crisis services. There's, there was money put into mobile crisis services in the um, American Rescue Plan Act that was um, 
just passed by Congress very recently. So, um, but you know, it's, it's enhancement, but it's not enough really to service every community. Um, you know, think about your larger cities, you know, your New York's, your Chicago's, and then of course, you know, even the Washington DC metro area um, and, and thinking about, you know, how many um, calls could possibly be diverted from law enforcement to 988 if we need a ground response. Um, and if we're gonna do it in a timely fashion, you know, as the CMS guide mentioned, which is, you know, not having somebody wait three hours for a mobile crisis unit, but perhaps 30 minutes, um, I, I am afraid that we are definitely not there yet. You know, most states just aren't in that place where that's going to be ca a capability yet. And that's probably going to take some years. So, um, unfortunately, you know, that's going to mean, um, that law enforcement, I think will continue to be the status quo until something else is done in those communities. Thank you. Um, and I had another question about privacy. I know privacy is a big issue right now. Um, what happens if somebody calls 988, uh, but they don't want to disclose their name or address? What would happen in that circumstance? So I've had a conversation with Vibrant, the company that operates um, the current Lifeline suicide prevention hotline, and, and they will still be the same company that operates um, 988 once it goes live. And the way it was explained to me is that um, they their services are considered confidential, but not anon anonymous. Um, so, and according to um, the CMS guidance that I mentioned earlier, GPS tracking is considered necessary um, to support efficient resource engagement. That's what the CMS guidance um, says and encourages. And I think what they're talking about there is being able to actually get those ground support services to people in their, their local community. So, um, you know, in some cases, uh, when somebody, if somebody calls 988 and their local community doesn't have a um, hotline center in their community, it's gonna roll over to the national hub, which is operated by Lifeline. Um, they'll need to route. Um, so they'll, they'll and it, in the case that somebody does need on the ground support, uh, you know, they're gonna need to figure out where that person is. Now, I was told that they generally ask people um, for their contact information, their name, et cetera. And, and um, that's typically the way that they prefer to get information and support to people. But um, we will talk um, now um, actually about a report that came from the National Council on Disabilities, which is a, um, a, federal, a federal agency. And I know we're, we're skipping ahead a little bit in our, our PowerPoint presentation to that, and we'll do. But I want to go to the, the report by the National Council on Disabilities. I know it's a few, it's a few slides down. And then we're going to come back to these slides. So we're a little bit out of order in our presentation. But yeah, here. So this report, um, which was a report done on COVID-19 very recently. Um, it's on the website for the National Council on Disabilities. This report covered many, many things. And one of them, interestingly, happened to be 988. Um, and in the report, they actually talk about um, individuals avoiding the use of hotlines because of concerns about the requirements that hotlines contact law enforcement in certain circumstances. So um, in the report, there are actually some examples of people. I remember one in particular being a, a student. I think she was a college student um, who used the hotline to report um, some, some concerns that she was having. And I think the, the operator did feel that she was um, suicidal and made the call um, to call for assistance. Now remember, calling for assistance without you know, the, the, the other um, a continuum of care pieces being in place means you're calling law enforcement for the most part. And so that's what happened. Um, and this student ended up being taken to a hospital um, and I think she was there for um, a number of hours and she there she might have been restrained at the hospital I'm not sure but um, I do remember that at the end of it she actually ended up with a bill um, for the the hospital treat the emergency room treatment and um, 
you know, she was pretty upset about it because she said, you know, while she was having some, some struggles, some emotional issues, I guess, that she shared in um, her call with the hotline operator, she wasn't at any point actually suicidal. And so that, you know, that's certainly something that's very um, detrimental. Um, and it's a huge pitfall in the sense that if we have more and more things like that happening, people are going to lose confidence in 988 very quickly. Um, and we will have lost this opportunity. I mean, and this is an opportunity to basically, um, you know, redesign the way that we deliver crisis care in this country because, you know, so far um, we've delegated so much of that to, to armed law enforcement. And so thank you for asking that. And now I actually want to go back up to the slides that we skipped earlier and talk a little bit about why, why this is so important. Yeah, why, you know, why this is so important. These are, I, I would like to take just a little bit of time to um, have people look at these slides and just um, reflect on the people and the scenarios where people are in crisis. Um, they have called for assistance, which again today generally means that you know they either called 911 or somebody called 911 on their behalf. And the situation has ended in violence. I want to stop here. Marcus David, Marcus David Peters. Um, the, I, I mentioned how Virginia was the first state to actually attach a fee to the funding of 988. Well, it's because of what happened to Marcus David Peters. He was a young um, science high school teacher in Richmond, Virginia, who was um, experiencing a mental health crisis while um, he was in, in his car. He had had um, an accident. Um, police were called. Um, Mr. Peters exited his car. He was he was naked. He was unclothed at the time, and clearly um, having um, having a mental breakdown. And um, he was shot. And so a confluence of things happened. Um, again, I mentioned that shot and killed, and, and and I mentioned that a number of advocates on the ground worked for several years um, to make sure that. Um, Virginia was taking seriously the need to have an alternative to 911 for people who are experiencing crisis. So um, the, the, the statute that enables the, the fee, the 988 fee to be enacted in Virginia just took place um, a couple months ago. So this is all, this is all brand new. Um, I saw state plans um, from the state of Virginia um, that talked about the rollout of a continuum of care over a number of years um, in different geographical areas in Virginia. Um, I think if you go to the Richmond Police Department's website, you'll actually see um, pretty front and center that they give guidelines on when a mobile crisis team or other um, health care um, professional should be engaged rather than the officer um, engaging or leading the encounter. So, um, you know, again, this is this is all brand new. We we sort of have to take a wait and see approach to how well these things are going to be enacted, how well they work. Um, but certainly, I, well, I should say not just a wait and see. Actually, I think we should engage <laughs> and to make sure that these things do work well. So I just wanted to stop there. And then I think where we are in our presentation now is actually we're going to talk a little bit about some of the legislation that's been floating around to support um, that continuum of care that we've been talking about. Um, remembering that 988 itself is just a hotline, which doesn't mean much unless you have um, services to support it. So. I am going to turn this over to our co-host, Kim Mushina of the Autism Society of America to tell us what's going on about potential legislation. Thanks, Carlene. Um, can everybody see me? I'm not sure. Yeah, I can see you. Okay, great. Sure. Okay. Um, thanks, Carlene. I really, I really appreciated all the information that um, that you, that you offered. 
Um, my name is Kim Mushnow. I'm the Vice President of Public Policy at the Autism Society of America. Um, we, uh, rep uh, we represent um, approximately 73 affiliates across the country um, <clears throat> that are, are working to improve the lives of, of people on the spectrum and, and their families. Um, and I also happen to be a family member of um, a, a Black autistic adult um, who's very tall and uh, doesn't communicate well. And we um, we had to restrict his movement for fear of, of uh, um, police or other individuals um, misinterpreting his style of communication and, and uh, the way he um, the way he uh, behaves. Um, uh, so I'm personally familiar with some of the problems. Um, so we're really pleased. Uh, the Autism Society of America has a, um, a, a suicide task force. We also have many <clears throat> programs across the nation to um, intended to uh, train first responders, at, um, including law enforcement, about um, autism and other intellectual and developmental disabilities that, uh, like uh, as Carlene said, often uh, co-occur with uh, mental health or behavioral health issues. Um, so <clears throat> we're also pleased uh, to see that there are other um, bills that are uh, just right now bills sitting on Capitol Hill, um, but there are bills being introduced um, or formulated to support the, the 988 and also in general to support uh, training of law enforcement and other uh, first responders um, and to support uh, uh, men mental health crises. Um, the, Autism Society, the Autism Society of America, we have um, uh, a, a hotline number of our own, not just for crises, but for any type of awareness or services or information. But we, uh, we frequently get um, calls where individuals are in some type of crises and there's um, no place for these individuals and their families um, to go very, very often. Um, so they're very much. We're very much in need of to build a capacity to help these help these individuals. Um, so there are several pieces of legislation that um, Carlene and I and others in the disability community are monitoring and and also uh, providing uh, input into and helping to move. Um, the first one on here, the 988 National Suicide Prevention Lifeline Implementation Act of 2021. Um, this this one is uh, very comprehensive, and um, it's being championed by uh, Representative Tony Cardenas from Pencil, uh, from California. Uh, the Safe Interactions Act, authored by Senator Bob Casey um, and Representatives uh, Wild from Pennsylvania and and Fitzpatrick from Pennsylvania, um, and then the uh, People's Response Act, uh, authored by Representative Cory Bush from Missouri. Um, so first, the 988 National Suicide Prevention Lifeline Implementation Act is, um, is one that's still in draft form. So uh, if you read the legislation and have ideas for ways to uh, amend it uh, to make it better, now's the time because it hasn't been introduced yet. And, and of course, there's, there's also opportunity along uh, its movement through Congress to amend it, but we're, uh, <clears throat> we're we just learned of this legislation and are just analyzing it right now. The Autism Society has not uh, formally um, sent in a letter of support yet because we're still reviewing it. But here's a little bit of what we have learned so far. Um, it would fund the launch, infrastructure, and modernization of the new uh, 988 hotline. It, it would do this by establishing um, a, a behavioral health crisis coordinating office in the US Department of Health and Human Services. So giving it a very high level in the, uh, in the government to oversee um, this nationwide, which, which would be really helpful. It would also support um, uh, more than 250 regional and local uh, call centers. It would um, provide a permanent authorization of up to $2.23 billion in the mental health um, block grant that already exists. 
and it would um, provide a pilot program for mobile crisis response, peer teams, and in-home crisis stabilization. Um, and it would authorize additional resources for specialized services for underserved populations, including uh, uh, people with disabilities. Um, it would also uh, authorize the use of Medicaid dollars for things like providing mental, uh, federal support for regional and local 988 call center operations and crisis programs. <clears throat> um, and it would expand um, the existing 10 state certified community behavioral health center, centers demonstrations to, so that any state could um, participate in these uh, demonstration programs. So allowing for Medicaid funding for some, uh, some of this implementation would be very, um, very helpful in building the capacity. Um, it would also support behavioral crisis responses on the ground with Health Resources Service Administration Capital Development Grants, um, behavioral uh, health workforce training programs, expanding them, um, and access and coverage of mental health and substance use disorder crisis response services. So basically expanding uh, some of the um, programs that um, the Health Resources Services Administration already ex were, that already exist. <clears throat> Next um, is a Safe Interactions Act. Um, this is a bill that was uh, um, originally authored by Senator Bob Casey from Pennsylvania. It has eight bipartisan co-sponsors. Um, there's a uh, <clears throat> companion bill in the House um, authored by Susan Wild and Brian Fitzpatrick from Pennsylvania. Uh, so it's really great, We're really pleased that it has bipartisan support. Um, this is a bill that would provide grants um, to allow nonprofit disability organizations like, like ours, like the ARC and Autism Society, um, who have already been involved in partnering with law enforcement agencies to train, um, train programs to support safe interactions between law enforcement of, uh, officers and people with disabilities. And it uh, specifically calls out, calls out mental health, uh, autism, uh, IDD, um, Alzheimer's, uh, blind and, and deaf individuals. Um, this training specifically um, includes or mandates that self-advocates, that, that is people um, with the lived experience be involved in the training and the oversight. Um, and we think that's very important. Um, and it would require a minimum of eight hours of training of new law enforcement uh, with four hours involving interactive sessions led by trainers with disabilities. So this would really help with first responders understanding different disabilities and how, how to interact um, with people with disabilities. Um, so this bill has been, um, was introduced in the previous Congress and this uh, and, and then the current 117th con uh, Congress, um, we just, advocates just need to help uh, build um, more co-sponsors uh, and push for it to be marked up and moved um, through Congress. And then um, Representative Cory Bush from Missouri uh, has a, um, a bill called the People's Response Act. Um, this would establish a division of community safety within the Department of Health and Human Services. It would also create a federal uh, health response unit that, to respond to the mass health crisis. And it would support cities and states that declare a public health emergency. Um, it would also award grants to community-led organizations, again, uh, like the ARC and Autism Society, on a rolling basis to support uh, community-based organizations that are designing, implementing, monitoring, and otherwise supporting health approaches to public safety. So the goal of this bill is to improve the crisis response and, um, and increase non-carceral health-based approaches to public safety. Uh, and it, uh, again, avoiding those, um, those unsafe interactions with law enforcement and preventing 
the pipeline to prisons. So um, Carlene and I are um, involved in putting together a, a disability policy seminar, the ARC, the Autism Society, uh, and about uh, six or seven other national disability organizations. Um, we put on a, di a disability policy seminar annually. This year, it's March 28th uh, through the 30th. Um, and the website, uh, www.disability policyseminar.org um, is will take you to the registration site um, and Carlene and I invite you to come to the whole disability policy seminar but we also want to mention that we we will be having a panel specifically on the legislation that we mentioned where you can learn more about it and then also about many other disability policy issues and then we have a day that is set aside to uh, go and visit your members of Congress to talk about this, le this legislative issue as well as uh, every other um, issue that's important to you and your, and your family. And um, I'm gonna hand it back to Carlene. Thank you, Kim. And I know that people have been putting some questions in the Q&A, so, and I've, I've responded to some of them. Um, but if you have questions, now is now is the time um, so that we can have a little bit of discussion on the information that was presented. And I know that, um, you know, with this issue, there are definitely some concerns about how um, 988 is going to is going to be rolled out. There are questions about the role of law enforcement. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about the question of um, anonymity concerning these calls. And so there may be some others that people have questions about. So we're happy to, Kim and I are happy to take them at this time. One, I see Leanne Davis asked about um, whether or not there's a, a toolkit. Um, and um, I, I did see one that we can send to registrants. Um, the Technical Assistance Collaborate, Collaborative mm -hmm. has put out a, a good one, and I'm sure we can add the CMS guidance that you referred to. Are there others that you know about, Carlene? Um, so uh, the ARC created just a general info sheet about 988 that had some questions on there that people might want to consider when talking to their state legislature um, and, and state legislators um, and others about this issue because, you know, I think the topic of disability won't come up automatically as um, people are, con well, disability outside of, I think, mental illness. So, um, you know, making sure that, you know, hotline support workers and um, any, you know, mobile crisis teams are familiar with intellectual disability, for example, I think would be fairly novel and probably unlikely to come up unless disability advocates themselves bring the issue up. So, um, so that the general information sheet we can make available, um, this webinar will be available on our, our website and maybe on our YouTube. Um, Station, and I'll also post the general information sheet on the ARCS website as well. So I don't see any open questions at the moment, but I'm happy to read some of the ones that I responded to earlier, somebody asked one, I, I, which I thought was really good, which is, will not, they're all good, but someone asked, will 988 work for schools? And I just like that one because the CMS guidance that just came out in December of 2021 actually encourages partnerships with schools for um, mobile crisis teams. And remember, mobile crisis teams are separate from 988. 988 really is just the hotline itself. But if we're building up, um, you know, associated supports around 988, then um, the, the development of perhaps having 
schools have clinicians and peer workers and that kind of, and peer workers for youth would be fantastic um, as part of a mobile crisis team. I mean, that would, to me, that would just be something that I would love to see in terms of reimagining um, crisis care in this country and certainly something that's needed um, in our school climate um, today. Um, the hotline itself, um, so anybody can call the hotline, and I think that includes children as well, because um, whenever um, stories in the newspaper are appear about um, suicide, even if it involves a, a child, um, the end usually has something about calling the um, Lifeline Suicide and Prevention Hotline, which right now is a much longer number. So I'm anticipating in the future it will remind people that 988 is available. I think we've got an open question. Let's see what that is. Well, Leanne Davis uh, from the ARC also <laughs> points out that um, Title II of the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, requires that people with disabilities have equitable access and equitable protection in government services, and that would include 988 calls. That's a good point, Leanne. Thanks. That's a very that's a very good point. And so, but you know, like like all things, it's it's one of those that we'd have to sort of enforce on our own. <laughs> um, uh, but that but you're absolutely right. The legal the legal obligation there. Um, Carleen, you also have a question in the chat that uh -huh. reads. You're struggling to staff social service, trauma-informed care staff now. What are plans to improve this? Yeah, I so the, again that CMS. So the CMS guidance referenced the best practices toolkit um, for you know all of the associated services that should be part of 988 in order to make 988 effective. And in that, it talks about making sure that teams are teams who go out and meet people on the ground are using um, trauma and uh, in, trauma based informed care. Mm -hmm. And so um, that is promising in itself that that's referenced in the best practices um, toolkit that came either from SAMHSA or, or CMS. So that they're asking for that and they're asking that um, communities who begin to implement a continuum of care use um, that um, training, I think is promising. But so part of this money um, to support 988 is being spent on developing a workforce around it. And so I know that a lot of that has to do with bringing in enough workers to support the hotlines right now, but they're also doing the same thing with um, mobile crisis units, which is why they increased the FMAP, you know, from the general 45, 55 to 85% for communities who are, who are gonna implement or enhance their mobile crisis services. So I, you know, in anticipation of this going live, I do think there are preparations being made, um, certainly by the administration to get some funding um, off the ground for needed services. But what I suspect is that once this goes live, calls are coming in. And, you know, we can anticipate that there are going to be a lot of fumbles here, um, that um, it's going to catch the eye of Congress members. Um, Kim talked a little bit about some of the legislation that's out there. And um, I think, you know, we'll see other efforts begin to roll out around this idea of um, reforming or transforming crisis care in this country. That's why I was so excited to see the Cardenas bill uh, because it's so comprehensive and, in, and includes workforce provisions um, and uh, the crisis mobile teams and building up the, the capacity overall using some of our existing government programs. And as Carlene pointed out earlier, the American Rescue Plan um, did provide a significant amount of funding. One of the things that I have found positive in our um, speaking to members of the administration and uh, leaders in Congress, there is a lot of recognition um, um, about this, the uh, mental health crisis in our country right now, which has significantly increased as a result of stress related to the pandemic. Um, in fact, there's a 
um, uh, hearing tomorrow morning on the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee uh, around this subject. Oh, good. Now that's good to know. And I should say, you know, we put up some um, bills that have been floating around Congress, but the ARC hasn't um, supported any of the bills um, at the moment. We're just giving you information about what's available. And um, we anticipate seeing more options becoming available as well. So. Do we see any other questions out there? No, I don't see anything. I think you've covered it all. <laughs> well, thank you. I want to thank uh, the ARC for being a um, for allowing the Autism Society to partner in, in this, and I, we certainly look forward to working with all of you um, to move some of this legislation and and help to help implement this important national program. Yes, thank you. And so we will make this presentation available. Um, I know we're gonna put it on the ARCS website and um, Kim, I'm not sure if, if you all would like to share. Okay, yeah. so the Autism Society we'll will share it as well. And um, you can also look for it, I think on, on the ARCS YouTube channel. And we, it's, and we will, um, the general information sheet, I will um, get finalized and available and, and make sure that's available. Cause I think that'll help people who had questions about um, doing some advocacy at the state level around 988 and making sure that people with disabilities are considered in that advocacy. I think that will help give you a framework of some of the questions that need to be asked and answered. So, wow. Well, we finished in a really good time. Okay. Thank you, everybody. And thank you so much for all of the, all of the people who attended live. This was, this was great. We enjoyed um, having you here and we look forward to keeping everybody up to date. We'll probably come back again. Bye.